Today on the Banner Says Podcast, we're going to be talking about Spotify acquiring Gimlet as well as Anchor. We'll talk about YouTube disabling the dislike button and a whole lot more. So go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 155 of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is what I says. Like always, down below, there are timestamps of everything that I talk about, so you can skip around and save a couple of minutes. But if you got the time, I would appreciate you checking out the entire dang episode. And like always, if you do want a different version of the show, either audio or video, you can find all of that at BandrewSays.com. Let's jump right into the news, and we're going to start with the big podcast industry news. Spotify has acquired both Gimlet Media and Anchor. And I do want to also point out that Spotify came out and said that they will spend $500 million to grow their podcasting business this year. Now, a little bit more information about these transactions. Spotify bought Gimlet for an estimated $230 million, which is an insane amount of money for a podcast production house who have made podcasts like Homecoming, which is now an Amazon original, I believe, and then they make other shows that I am not aware of. I am sure they are very high quality considering the price that they paid for them, but they are a podcast production house with studios, with everything associated with that. But as far as the Anchor acquisition, it wasn't disclosed how much they paid for it. I heard on the new media show that it was estimated maybe 25 or $50 million, and that is really all the information we have there. So, first I want to share my thoughts on the Gimlet acquisition. And I think this is likely going to mean that Gimlet shows are going to be exclusive to Spotify for a set amount of time, and then after that set amount of time elapses, then they will be distributed to all other podcast platforms. This is a model that places like Earwolf currently do with their premium shows like Threedom. I believe they are just now releasing the episodes from Threedom that came out a year ago. So the release for the public, unless you pay that premium, is a year late. So this won't work if there is any kind of time-sensitive material. It is going to have to be evergreen content if they do use this strategy. Now, this concerns me because of what we've been seeing with the amount of subscription services coming out that have exclusive content. What I mean there is it seems like we're seeing a growing number of television networks coming out with their standalone streaming services. You got AMC, I believe they have one. You got CBS, that's the main one, CBS All Access with Star Trek. And then they got the Twilight Zone, which, oh my God, it's Jordan Peele's Twilight Zone. They may make me sign up for it but we're seeing more television networks come out with their standalone subscription services. And then you have movie companies, movie studios like Disney coming out with Disney All Access or whatever the heck it's called, where if you want access to stream these Disney films, now you can't pay for Netflix. Now you have to pay Disney directly. It is just this constant segregation of these content providers where they each want a piece of the pie, meaning you as a content consumer, I guess, have to pay each of these content creation companies and platforms to get access to it rather than one aggregate like Netflix initially was. So with that being said, what's next here? Are we going to start to see podcast networks having their own standalone subscription-based streaming services like we have with Earwolf? Or, I mean, I can't imagine Spotify is paying $200 million for the sake of creating podcasts and then just putting it everywhere. I can't imagine that $200 million is going to be paid off in ad revenue. I imagine they are hoping that this will lead to people signing up for Spotify Premium to get access to these high-quality shows. Or at least I am hoping that they are high-quality shows considering the price that they paid. Or what about record labels? That's something that I was thinking about. Do you think that we'll start to see record labels creating their own streaming services where if you want access to all the Frank Sinatra, you got to sign up for RCA Records streaming service or Capitol Records or whatever it was. I don't even know. Do you think we'll start to see that? 
It seems like there is so much money in getting people to sign up for your individual streaming platform that more and more people are starting to do that, or more and more companies, rather, are starting to do that. And now it seems like it is really starting to make its way into podcasting, which kind of is disheartening. I liked the whole podcast, F you, this is punk, we're going to do it for free, we're going to tell everybody to F themselves, that whole mentality, and now it's becoming very corporate which is somewhat disappointing. However, I should point out that I think it's good that a company is investing so much money in the podcast market because that's good. If there's people putting money into podcasting, unlike Apple not really investing in podcasting, I think there is room for improvement. I think there's room for innovation. And Spotify, Spotify, Spotify may be the company who leads to that innovation because they are investing so heavily in it. We will have to wait and see. I want to hear from you there, though. Now, as far as Anchor, this is going to be a bit of a rant. I apologize. I didn't think I had very strong opinions on this, and then I was in a voice chat. Turns out, I have a lot of opinions on this. The only reason that I can see Anchor being acquired, really, is because of advertising. What I mean there is they've developed a platform or a system that allows them to dynamically insert host read advertisements, which seems pretty cool because there have been people talking about dynamically inserted ads in podcasts, but it has all been pre recorded radio style ads, which nobody gives a crap about. The reason why ads in podcasts seem to work so well is because it is host read, it has that personal touch to it. They have their relationship with the host and the host is telling them about this product that they believe in or think that the listener would want. So that is why I think they were likely acquired. But regardless of that, this entire thing, the acquisition of Anchor and my distaste for Anchor has led me to think a lot about how I don't like the current state of the startup marketplace. What I mean there is it seems like there's so little focus on sustainability, meaning companies seem to start up just in order to get acquired. Companies are no longer starting because they believe in something and want to run a company for the rest of their life and leave something for their kids because they think it's a, a viable option. It's, it's a good thing for the entire marketplace. It just seems like, hey, let's go ahead and start up a company to get acquired by Google or one of these big companies, one of the big three. In this case, not one of the big three, but Spotify. That seems to be the current state of the startup market. This is completely from somebody outside of it, though, so I could be completely wrong. Maybe there are those people who are starting up companies and saying, this is what I believe in. I'm not going to sell no matter what. And you don't hear about those because it's not sexy to write a story about somebody just making a company and running it forever. What's sexy is, oh my God, this company that just started up got sold for millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> so maybe I'm just completely in the wrong here. But I guess to elaborate on this a little bit more, what I mean is when a company starts up and they get that venture capital or those angel investors, they have this influx of money. And all they need to do initially is to show growth and show potential for the first few years, which when you have that influx of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, probably isn't that difficult. For instance, with Anchor, they were paying a $10 CPM to podcasters to have ads on their show. That sounds amazing, right? Oh my God, I can't believe that Anchor has got this dynamic ad insertion and they've brought on advertisers to pay you to read their ads on your show. Do you know who those advertisers were? It was Anchor. Anchor was taking the, the, the venture capital money or the angel investor money or whatever startup money they had and then using that money to pay people to read ads on their show. Do you know what that did? That made a lot of brand new podcasters think, oh my God, I can make money with this. This is going to be the way that I make my millions podcasting. So they start a show on Anchor because that's where this dynamic ad insertion is. Then they realize, oh wow, I'm only getting 50 or 100 downloads per episode. I guess I am not going to become a millionaire podcaster. And they stop. But that sign up shows a big growth. 
in their service so they can inflate their growth numbers and their subscriber and their user numbers to show these Spotify's, these these potential acquirers. I don't know what the name there be. The potential companies that want to buy them and say, look how much we've been growing. But I don't know what those meetings were like. Maybe they didn't say the reason we're growing so much is we are advertising on our own platform, (laughs) paying people 10 bucks for every thousand views. Is that sustainable? Probably not. You can't just earn money from ads that are your own ads, if that makes any sense. So the only money that was coming in seemingly was from Anchor paying themselves (laughs) from ads. That makes no sense. So maybe Anchor will become the YouTube of podcasting. I don't know. But they certainly need to get other advertisers besides themselves on the platform that will be willing to pay a $10 CPM. But here's something that will be an issue for them. You know, they may be running into issues with controversial content. You know that whole thing that YouTube got into trouble with with their advertisers? That problem that YouTube, the biggest video platform on the internet, backed by the lar- one of the largest companies in the world, was unable to solve that whole thing? Yeah, Anchor is apparently going to solve it. Advertisers won't have a problem with it. Yeah, you can go ahead and put ads on all your shows. Who cares what the content is? That's going to come back and bite you in the butt real quick. If YouTube can't figure it out, I highly doubt that Anchor would be able to figure it out. How are they going to sort through and understand all the content that's being uploaded to their platform and say, okay, this is advertiser friendly. This is not advertiser friendly. I highly doubt they will do a better job at that than Google, meaning they will have to just say, okay, nobody under 10,000 downloads is going to be able to advertise. And then all those people who signed up for Anchor for the dynamic ad insertion because they thought, this is how I can make money. Now, don't earn money. Do you see the problem here? Do you see the problem? They are artificially inflating the numbers with this $10 CPM advertising for everybody because that is what people want when they start podcasting. They want to earn a crap ton of money. That's my take on it. So, you know, maybe Anchor can do it. Maybe they will become the the YouTube of podcasting. I don't know. I am just very reluctant or very skeptical of them. I do hope they they succeed, though, because that would be awesome. Podcasting does need the YouTube of podcasting. My God, that was a lot longer of a first story than I was expecting. (laughs) This next one's going to be shorter, I'm sure. YouTube, working to fix the dislike mobs. Do you know what that is? What is a dislike mob, Bandrew? It's a group of people that go to a video and dislike a video by giving it a thumbs down prior to even watching the video. Everybody's seen this. You've gone and seen, heck, the YouTube Rewind. What was it? 10 million dislikes and a million thumbs ups. I I doubt that many people watched it before disliking it. They just thought, hey, this is fun. Let's dislike it. I am sure that's what happened. But in a recent Creator Insider video, dislike mobs were discussed, and the host shared some ideas that have been bouncing around the YouTube headquarters on how to mitigate this issues. And there are some fun ones in here. Not bad ideas in the slightest. (laughs) I am very snarky today. I apologize. So option one that he discussed. Currently, the like and dislike numbers are shown by default. And you do have the ability to turn this off in your creator studio or in your upload defaults. Well, what this first option would be is just to have the dislike number or the the upvote and downvote number hidden by default. So it would just show the thumbs up and thumbs down. It wouldn't tell you how many liked or how many disliked. That's a terrible idea. The dislike and like ratio are very important to see. You need to know, is this a high quality video? Is this clickbait? That's what that number tells you very quickly. Option two, require the person disliking the video to provide information on why they are disliking the video. You know, that's not terrible. It might actually provide the content creator some useful information. For me, I would love to know why people dislike my video. Is it because they hate me? Is it because they hate my voice? Is it because they hate my opinion? Is it because they're trolls? I don't know. It's maybe all of the above. Maybe I'm just terrible at what I do. I don't know. I would love to know. Option three, 
Remove dislikes altogether. This is the worst idea of all of them. Do not do this. YouTube, if you are watching, do not do this. This will create some backlash. They will not like this. Users of YouTube will be very unhappy. And it seems like the only reason you're considering this is because you made a terrible video and people really, really disliked it. I honestly don't know if it was a dislike mob that led to that becoming the most disliked video out there on the platform, or if it's just that it was such a disconnected video that did not represent what the YouTube platform really is. I don't know, but it seems like that's why you're considering these changes. And the fourth option would be to remove the dislike count. And you're thinking, Bander, that sounds like number one. No, just remove the dislike count, but leave the like count. Huh. That's a terrible idea as well, because what information does that provide you? It doesn't provide you anything. It just says, oh, this many people liked it. I don't know how many people disliked it. You could go the Reddit way where a thumbs up or an up arrow and a down arrow, they, they cancel each other out. I think that's how Reddit works. I haven't been on there in a long time. So the only idea of these four options that seem remotely decent is the dislike survey. but there's a problem with that and that it would de-incentivize people from disliking videos because now they have this added work. And I do think it is a good idea on the other hand, because as a creator, that would be very useful information rather than just a thumbs down where somebody's not going to leave a comment saying, this is why I disliked your video. Just a quick thumbs down. And then why did you dislike this video? Bad content. Well, what is that? What does that mean? The, the incorrect content or, or, or yeah, incorrect content. I, I don't know. Uh, terrible voice. <laughs> I don't know what other options there would be. They could have a bunch of them. But like I said, that would de-incentivize people from disliking videos. And that would give YouTube a bad look. Now, here's an idea. Here's an idea I thought of within five seconds of watching this and thinking, oh, all of those were bad ideas. What about in order for a dislike to count, that viewer would have to have watched the video for 30 seconds or more. I believe that's what it takes to count as a view on your platform. So why, if somebody's view does not get counted, would their dislike get counted? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know if that's already part of your system or not. That's a possibility. And you can have that one for free. I don't know. <laughs> I just think that if somebody watches a video for five seconds, they don't have enough information to determine, I don't like this video. With 30 seconds, yeah, they may have a good idea, probably, probably not the best idea, but they will have a general idea, a general gist of the content and have a good idea if they're gonna like it or not. And here's one that I would really love to, to hear from you about. I would love to know what you think about this. What do you think they should do about dislike mobs? Do you think it should just be ignored because it it may harm the distribution of a video? But I don't know how prevalent this is as an issue. I don't know how many creators have every single video disliked by a huge dislike mob. I am not sure how serious of an issue it is. Do you think this is an issue that needs to be addressed? And if so, do you think the options they outlined are good options or do you think they're terrible options just like YouTube Rewind 2018 was? Let me know in the comments down below and I will link the Creator Insider video down below if you want to check it out. Now we got Apple banning Facebook and Google's enterprise certificates. First up, what are enterprise certificates used for? It gives these companies the ability to test and distribute apps for internal use, meaning they could test new builds of an app or allow for employee only apps like shuttle pickup or cafeteria menus or anything like that. And this means that these enterprise certification apps did not have to go through the same approval process as the normal app store because they aren't available in the normal app store. So with that background, why was Facebook's certificate removed? Facebook allowed for people to download an app called the Facebook research app and it would track everything that you did on your phone and would pay you $20 a month for this access and information. Facebook came out and insisted that this was not spying, 
and everyone who used it went through proper onboarding and that all the teenagers had parental consent forms signed. Now, I do actually agree with Facebook in a rare turn of events. I do actually agree with them that this was not spying because people did intentionally go and download this app and sign up for the service knowing that they were giving Facebook access to everything on their phone. Everything on their phone would be recorded and reported back to Facebook and they would be compensated with a crisp $20 bill and ones and zeros sent to them somehow. They knew that, so I agree this was not spying. However, I will go ahead and push back on the whole parental consent forms. I doubt that there was any kind of proper parental consent form signed for teenagers and people under 18. Do you mean like those those porn sites that say, are you over 18? Click yes to confirm. No, I am not 18. Get me out of here. You mean like that kind of parental consent form where it says, yeah, I'm 18. I guarantee you that everybody that clicks that little porn button saying, yeah, I'm over 18 is not over 18. So if you have a little button in your your little spying app, your (laughs) spying app in quotation marks, and it just says, yeah, my parents consent to me being a part of this. And that's all the due, due, due diligence that you do. I am having such a hard time speaking today. That is not a proper parental consent form. I assure you, most parents didn't know their kids were doing this. Okay, with that being said, let's talk about Google. Why was Google certificate removed? According to Forbes, it was the exact same reason. They had an app that would track everything you do on your phone, report that back to Google, and Google would compensate you. And this was titled the Google ScreenWise Meter. Huh. So, both companies were using their enterprise certificates to sidestep the application approval process to get into the iOS App Store in order to install an app that records everything that you do on your phone. In return, you get compensated with that crisp $20 bill. Now, I will admit that I understand this. When I was in high school, I didn't have a job, I was broke. I would have loved to receive a $20 bill every single month for seemingly doing nothing. Just like filling out those surveys online, I would have loved to have earned $20 for that. I could, in every three months, I could buy a new video game. That would be incredible. But if you're able to avoid this, do not do this. This is stupid and your data is worth so much more than just $20 a month. And I do also understand that this is opt in, but this kind of goes back to what I have been saying a little bit too much, where I say that privacy is no longer a right. It is a privilege for the wealthy or the well off. And in this case, it's not a complete direct comparison here, or it doesn't completely fit. But this whole system, these apps that record everything and send your data back to the company and pay you 20 bucks, it may not be infringing on your rights, but it is definitely exploiting people who don't have a big bank account because $20 seems like a lot of money to somebody who earns $400 a month or $400 every paycheck. 20 bucks, that's a lot. That's a couple of meals. That's coffee for a month if you buy a couple pounds at the grocery store. So it's not directly exploiting their or removing their rights or infringing on their rights, but it is exploiting them for this data. Now, with that being said, I think it makes perfect sense why Apple banned or removed both of these companies' enterprise certificates. Because if I'm not mistaken, those certificates are intended for internal employee use, testing of apps, those cafeteria menus, those shuttle things, those apps that are essential for these companies to do their jobs. It is not intended to allow these companies' workarounds to allow non-employees to download apps that would not pass muster if they had to go through the general app store rules and regulations, which seems like that's exactly what they were doing. They were saying, you know what? We know this won't get past the actual Apple iOS app store rules. So let's go ahead and use this enterprise certificate and send it directly to somebody's phone. So it makes perfect sense. If you're breaking the rules of using or for having an enterprise certificate, yeah, it should be removed. Now, as far as Apple, They sort of had to do this for optics reasons. 
You want to know why? At CES, they had a big banner ad that said, <laughs> this is just perfect timing. They had a big banner ad that said, what happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone. And then you have this coming out maybe a week or two later. <laughs> that, no, it doesn't. As soon as you download any kind of app that is not an Apple app, what, what happens on your iPhone does not stay there. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It gets uploaded to whoever's app that is, and they know everything about you. So they sort of had to do this for optic reasons and just show people, you know what? We are a privacy company. And I also don't think that this shows that Apple has too much power. I've heard some podcasters talking about that. This shows that Apple, it, it, they, they got a monopoly. I don't think so. I think that if Target had some rules and regulations saying you can't release toothpaste that poisons people. You can't sell something that shoots kids in the eye. And then a company was selling something at Target that poisoned people or shot kids in the eye. And Target said, okay, you can't sell your stuff here anymore. I don't think that shows that Target has a monopoly. I think that that just shows that Target has rules and regulations and terms of service. And if you violate them, bye bye, get out of here. That's my take on it. And if you do want to read this, I'll link a Forbes article down below. I am very wordy today. I am very long-winded today. Anyways, next story. Apple is apparently working on a seventh generation iPod touch. I am including this one here because I wanted to have one good Apple story because it has not been a good couple of weeks for them. So in iOS 12.2, someone located code that mentioned new iPads but more importantly, a new iPod Touch. And there is no more information about the iPod Touch, but I am actually kind of excited about this. One reason is because I listen to the Complete Privacy and Security podcast or the Privacy, Security, and OSINT podcast, whatever the name is now, and they use an iPod to avoid having cellular antennas constantly geolocating them and sending that back to their ISP. Pretty smart. That may be something that I use this for, but I would love to see them release a new iPod that does high res and or lossless audio playback and has a good headphone amp in it. But this is just wishful thinking. I can nearly guarantee you that this is never going to happen. And there is a very specific reason why I think that this will never, ever happen, no matter how much I want it to, and no matter how many people beg Apple to do it. You want me to tell you? I'll go ahead and tell you. I won't string you along. So Apple will sell you in iTunes, meaning if you buy a song off of iTunes or if you're streaming music off of Apple Music, you are getting an audio file that is 256 kilobits per second. That is a lossy audio codec, meaning it is compressed and some information is lost. It is not a perfect representation of the original audio file. Now, also, currently, Apple doesn't offer a way to stream lossless audio or buy lossless audio. So why does this mean that Apple won't create a device with this focus with high res or lossless playback or a really nice headphone amp? Apple has been and Apple will continue to focus on growing their services revenue, which includes purchasing stuff from iTunes and Apple Music which again, just to remind you, streams a lossy audio file at 256 kilobits per second. So if Apple released an iPod that had high res and lossless playback and a really nice headphone amp, it would be Apple essentially saying, okay, go ahead and pay us for this hardware and then don't give us any more money because we aren't able to provide you content that meets the requirements of why you're buying this device. You're buying this device to intentionally play high res lossless audio files, and we have no way to distribute that content to you. So go ahead and pay us for this hardware and then go pay Tidal or pay Spotify to get higher quality audio files or go ahead and download some high res audio files from one of those high res websites that charge way too much for a high res audio file. So because of that, I am almost certain that this will just be an iPod with an updated processor. It apparently won't have Face ID or Touch ID, and maybe it'll have an improved screen. But what remains to be seen is, will Apple have the courage 
to remove the headphone jack from an iPod? Will they have the courage to remove a headphone jack from a digital audio player? <laughs> Let's see how courageous Apple can truly be. My God, I wish they would just get their crap together. Stream lossless or at least 320 kilobits per second. Come on, Apple. Or by title. By title. Get with it. Get your crap together. Now, here's a fun one from Apple. Apple completely sh the bed in terms of privacy. So a bug on iOS 12.1, I believe it was, allowed people to listen to your audio prior to you answering a FaceTime call. Here is how it worked. You would call somebody via FaceTime video, and before that person answers, you would swipe up and click to add your phone number. That would make the FaceTime program assume that you were already in this call, so you could hear the person's microphone prior to them actually saying, pick up the phone. So you could spy on somebody. Now, Facebook, this is what spying is. I agree with you. This would be spying. But it gets even worse. If the person you were calling and you had already swiped up to add your number and you were listening to your, their microphone, if they were to hit the power button or the volume button to ignore your call, that would start streaming your video to them and they could see your face. It would stream your face cam video. That's not bad at all. No, this is perfectly fine. This is perfectly fine. Now, I should note this only worked on iPhones that had, what was it, group FaceTime enabled. So I think it was iOS 12 or 12.1 that had this enabled. Older OSs didn't have this exploit. Apple quickly came out, disabled group FaceTime. Everybody was saying, here's a quick and easy way to disable FaceTime, and that solved the problem. And Apple has come out with a fix now. So if you haven't already, go into your system and update immediately. This is bad. <laughs> this is stupid. This is terrible. Update your iPhone because this is a serious security flaw. Apple, you really crapped the bed on this one. And then you rolled around in it. You didn't even wake up and realize, oh, I crapped the bed. I need a shower. You just rolled around in it and it, wee, I'm rolling around in poo. You're disgusting, Apple. Get your crap together and, and wipe yourself off and clean yourself. Take a shower. You're disgusting. You freaking dopes. Sh the bed. Sh the bed. You dopes. Now let's get to some more security news. Travel apps were secretly recording your screen. I'm so glad that I came back. <laughs> I missed you guys. And I am coming back with some very happy news for you. According to a TechCrunch article, Air Canada, Hollister, Expedia, and a whole lot more were recording every tap and swipe you made on their apps. Now, these apps used a service called Glassbox, which is a customer experience analytics firm, which includes a session replay technology. What that means is when you are in this company's app or when you are in this app that uses Glassbox, it is essentially screen recording everything that you do in that app and sending it back to them so they could troubleshoot, so they can know exactly how you're using their app. That doesn't seem that bad, right? Now, it was found that these session replays, this is why it's so bad, these session replays were not properly masking sensitive information like credit card numbers and passport numbers. That's where the problem comes in. They were supposed to be censoring certain information in these app recordings, in these screen recordings, but they were not, and that was exposing, they were storing unencrypted copies of your credit card number, your passport number, all sorts of sensitive information in a database. So not only is this terrifying, but something that makes it even worse. They didn't even disclose it to the user. So the app researcher who discovered this flaw, this exploit, this, this stupid decision by these companies, he checked their privacy policies and he couldn't find a mention anywhere in any of them stating that they are going to record the, the user's screen and send it back to this company for analysis. It was nowhere there. So Apple came out and told these companies to either disclose the screen recording, remove the screen recording function, or face being banned from the App Store. Something that I found confusing. Later in the article, they came out and said that, they, that Apple gave these apps one day to remove the code and resubmit their app 
or the app would be removed from the store. So in the same article, in the same article, in the same article, it sounds like Apple said, okay, we don't care about the disclosure. Just remove the code. You can't do this anymore. So Apple did something good. They're starting to wash themselves off in the shower now. So there you go. Don't have these, these Travelocity, maybe I shouldn't be saying that name because I don't know if they were part of this. The Expedias, the Air Canadas, the Hollisters, don't have those apps on your phone. They're all tracking you. The end is nigh. You want to know how close the end is? We got another one. <laughs> you know those DNA testing kits? The, hey, find out where your heritage is from. Those DNA testing kits that seem like such a fun thing to do. I want to find out. I'm not going to go there. They're being used to solve crimes. They're being used to solve crimes. <laughs> how is that happening? This is supposed to be private, right? A lab that is helping solve these crimes is owned by the same person who owns one of these DNA services, Family Tree DNA. They have been working with the FBI to solve some cases. So they accept DNA samples from the FBI that get uploaded to their database, and then they search for possible matches. So that's really the entire story. These companies are getting copies of your DNA. They are allowing, I guess, police stations and federal law enforcement agencies to submit DNA samples that they have that are unidentified to these labs to search their database to see if anybody is just stupidly enough swabbed the inside of their mouth or spit into a tube and sent it to them and said, oh, you know who that killer is? It was Bandrew. He spit into a tube. What a dope. We, <coughs> we caught him. <coughs> I'm okay. I... <laughs> Okay, I am back. So is solving a crime a good thing? Of course. Catching violent crime offenders, violent criminals is a good thing. But is thinking, I'm just going to send my DNA, I'm going to spit into a tube and send it to this company and find out what my heritage is. And then that company is going to allow the FBI to query that database. Is that, is that okay? I don't think so. I don't think that is okay. I've screamed about the issues with this breach of your social security number and how problematic that is because you have no way to change your social security number. You know what else you can't change? Your DNA. <laughs> and here they are just saying, go ahead and spin to this tube. We'll tell you exactly where you come from, but we'll also let anybody who pays us query this data. It seems like a terrible, terrible idea. This just reinforces the fact that you should not be using these services. Do not use them. Just do not use them. You shouldn't be doing anything online. You should delete your internet profiles. You should delete your, cancel your ISP, cancel your smartphone, get a flip phone that's prepaid and go live in a cabin in the woods. I'll meet you out there. It'll be a fun meetup. We can do whatever the heck we want because nobody's tracking us. So I'll see you guys out there. That'll be fun. Okay, we got one thing. Last piece of news. One thing, last piece of news. Words are hard today. <laughs> um, Ultraviolet is shutting down. If you don't know what Ultraviolet is, it is a movie locker for your digital movies. If you've ever purchased a film, a hard copy of a film, and it said DVD, Blu-ray, and digital, Ultraviolet is the digital copy. It, it gave you a code in the box, and you would enter that into ultraviolet.com or whatever, and it would give you a digital copy of that film. Well, on July 31st, Ultraviolet is shutting down. You may be thinking, well, I'm losing my entire digital library. Calm down. Calm your tits. No, you're not. You're going to be fine. Just calm down. All you got to do is link your Ultraviolet account to another service like Vudu or Movies Anywhere, and you'll continue to have, have access to these movies. And to be frank with you guys, this is exactly why I have been moving more and more towards physical media again. I understand it's inconvenient, it takes up a lot of space, but Apple, Google, every single digital distribution platform, you may pay for a film, but if they lose the rights to that film or that album, they can no longer distribute it, so they will revoke your access to that, even though you've paid for it. If you buy a physical copy of a CD or a DVD or a Blu-ray, 
The only way they can physically remove the rights for you to watch that is to come break into your house and steal it from you. So that's why I've been going more towards physical media and I've been enjoying it. It's been fun getting these physical CDs and flipping through the booklets and reading all the stuff. It, it adds another level to it. it, makes it more fun. So that's what I've been doing. Fear not, you'll be fine. Just link it to another account so another company has all your information. Why not? They already have it all. Now, what I've been testing. You've been listening to it. Last week ended the run of the Neumann KSM-8, the dynamic microphone. No, not KSM-8, the BCM-705. I'm a dopey, dopey idiot. The KSM-8 is a sure. This is that dynamic microphone. It was fine. It was fine. For 700 bucks, I was expecting a lot different, a lot more of a shocking revelation. I was expecting a borderline religious experience, which I did not receive with it. So from an atheist, you know, that's, that's a lot to, to hope for. I wanted a religious experience, a $700 dynamic microphone that's stupid expensive. And it was, it was fine. That's all I can say about it. But what I have been testing now, you've been listening to the AKG C414 XLS. Another stupid expensive microphone. This is a multi-pattern condenser microphone. And there are two variants of this model. There is the XLS and the XLII or the XL2. I went with the XLS because it is slightly less exaggerated in the presence and treble area. So it just gives a smoother, less overboosted sound, and I am really liking it. I am currently using, I think it's the super cardioid polar pattern, and I don't have the high pass on, and I don't have, yeah, no high pass, super cardioid, and that's all that I am doing to it right now. Of course, I am running compression, all that in post, but that's about it. I am not doing anything else to it. I will not EQ it this week. Except a de I will add a de because I don't want to kill people with my S's. So that's what I've been testing. BCM705, meh. It was a microphone, an expensive microphone that was fine. And then the AKG C414 XLS, this is what I'll be using for the next month. And then I'll share my thoughts. And then eventually, when I have a solution to recording electric guitar here, then I'll get back to actually doing the full reviews. Damn you, Cheryl. Damn you straight to hell. Now let's jump to what you had to say. The first comment comes from Sound Speeds. And he says, Bandrew, regarding the new rules on advertising on YouTube, do the new rules only affect new content released or are we expected to go back and change all previous reviews to indicate there's an ad? In my case, I never grant approval rights to the manufacturers of products that I review, so I may be in the clear for now. About the Roadcaster, great. Multi-tracking is available in firm, firmware 1.1.0, but allow me to give you and your viewers a warning. Data rates for SD and micro SD cards can only go so fast, and if you are recording too many tracks, you can stress your media and cause write errors. No telling what that will mean for the Roadcaster, but even in professional recorders that record a media, like the Sound Device's 6 Series and 7 Series recorders, along with the 9 Series AV recorders, such errors have led to save issues like not even saving the file, deleting after stopping, and giving a warning and recording, but with obvious artifacts in your audio rendering, it damaged and useless. Just because you can track everything doesn't mean you should. And as for the media you use, only use the fastest and most reliable brands available. A cheap, slow card can and will cause you a world of fuss. Sound speeds. Great, great comment. Thank you for it. And I appreciate you sending in your expertise. So first off, since we're both located in the U.S., doxed, I know, I just doxed Alan. Hey, fellow American, North American, U.S., United States of American, why are we just called Americans? Why are we? That makes no sense. Because there's North Americans and South Americans. Why are we just called Americans? We should be called United States of Americans, right? Sorry, <laughs> Sorry I just thought about that. That makes no sense to me. Anyways. Since we live in the U.S., I do not believe that we have to follow the U.K.'s advertising laws, which I talked about in the last episode, episode 154. And as far as this 
being retroactive? I am not sure, but I would guess that it is going to be retroactive. And that is why YouTube having that includes paid promotion thing is so nice. All you would have to do is go back through your YouTube creator studio, go to the videos that have a paid promotion and click that button. And then it displays that in the lower left hand corner. I think if YouTube wanted to make this as useful as possible, they should add a few other options like video contains affiliate marketing or product provided for video, something like that. I don't know. I am not a YouTube guru or, or employee. YouTube, you come up with it. You figure it out. <laughs> then as far as the Roadcaster Pro, you raise some very good points. All I can really say is we will have to wait and see. I haven't heard any issues like that with the with the Zoom L12, which has 12 tracks of recording, but I don't really follow forums talking about that. That's a possibility. Although with the Zoom L12, you have the option to record each individual track. I don't know if it automatically records all the tracks. I don't know. You raise a good point. I'll take your word for it since you know a lot more about multi-tracking and the stress of losing a recording when 100 people are working on a scene and it costs a lot of money to have every single person redo everything. So I'll take your word for it and we'll have to wait and see. That would be an interesting test. Get a bunch of different media cards, different speeds, different sizes and see how they work. Good question. Good point. Next comment comes from Up All Night and he says, have you ever been approached by a company to do a negative review on a competitor's product? Up all night, that is a very good question. And I have yet to receive any requests for companies to give a competitor's product a bad review. That would be a very risky request, <laughs> I gotta say. That would be very risky for somebody to send me an email saying, hey, you know, you should go ahead and give this other product a really bad review. That would be... <laughs> that would be... <laughs> Let me tell you why it would be risky. Even when I get emails that are asking me just to review something and they CC me along with 50 other or 60 other creators, I publicly shame them and reply to all. <laughs> I'll just write them snarky emails right back to them. So all 60 or 70 or however many creators there are all see what I am typing to them and saying, no, I don't want your product. I would have loved the product, but clearly you don't want to just email me. You're spamming all of us. And I publicly shame them. But that raises a question. If a company were to send me that email and then in the footer, it says confidential or proprietary information, would that keep me, would that legally bind me to not disclosing that? Even if I did not sign anything saying, I will not disclose this. If that's part of an email, does that mean that I am legally unable to disclose that information? Any lawyers who watch or listen to this, let me know. That would be interesting to know. Then I could publicly shame any company who asks me to do that. But I doubt anybody would. <laughs> I don't think any company is that stupid. Is there companies that are that stupid? Up all night. Do you know of any companies that are that stupid? Let me know. Good question. Next comment comes from Fat Lowell's radio, and he says, in regards to the conspiracy delisting, here's the problem. How can we put any faith in the algorithm, which is proven to be flawed and continually makes mistakes? I can even totally see them blanket delisting any videos that even mention conspiracies in the tags, titles, or descriptions. This means that even videos like Purgatory Ironworks's video in which he shows that half the temperature of jet fuel can contort steel to the point that it snaps, basically a counter to the jet fuel can't melt steel beams argument, could fall under the delisting scrutiny, even though he's not arguing in favor of the conspiracy. It's a bad idea and only pushes a narrative of censorship of differing opinions from YouTube. People will inevitably start comparing this to Patreon banning Sargon. It's a lose-lose situation. Plus, in my experience, it's better to leave them up and in the public eye so that people can draw their own conclusions. By hiding things away like that, it makes the idea of it's the truth, that's why it's hidden, more plausible. Sorry for the book. I just feel strongly about this. Fat Lowell's Radio, thank you very much for the comment. And I gotta say, I agree with you pretty much on every single point that you made. The thing that bothers me most about this type of censorship or hiding of content 
it's treating people like children. Like We don't think that you're smart enough to understand that what is being said is complete nonsense, so we're going to make sure that you can't even watch it because we know you're too stupid to be able to make that distinction for yourself. I don't know where we went from, you're an adult, you can make up your own mind to, we need to protect you from this dangerous information because it may upset you or confuse people who may not be the sharpest egg in the tool basket. When did we go from that to that? I don't know. Why did the world get so nerfed? I I heard somebody say that once. I don't know if that's offensive or not. I don't know what's offensive anymore. I don't know. Why, Why can't people make up their own mind anymore? Oh, this person saying that, that there are crisis actors is crazy. Well, you know what? We can't trust you to make that conclusion for yourself. So we're going to go ahead and just keep it, keep you from watching it. We know that there are, st- why are we changing the, co- the content distribution for stupid people? Why are we doing that? I don't understand. Like I said last week, there's not enough clarification that YouTube provided about what will classify a conspiracy video. You could misinterpret the history or whatever, and it's considered a conspiracy video. Like I brought up, the JFK assassination, you can't talk about that now under the way that they described it because that will get you delisted. It's stupid. I think this will lead to people trusting YouTube less, and ironically enough, it will lead to its own set of conspiracies about YouTube hiding conspiracy videos. I don't think they see that. I don't think they see the irony. Okay, let's get to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. All right, guys, if you got any any questions... If y'all got any questions, go ahead and send them to ask. My God, speaking is so hard today. Hey, welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions, go ahead and send them to askbandrew at gmail.com. And I will likely answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. The first email comes from Clay. He says, howdy, Bandrew. Tis the season. Many will be exchanging gifts and looking to return things. Well, this clearly came in before Christmas. I apologize. I am just now getting to it. And he asks, in your experience, what are some best practices when preparing? Oh, my God. I think I'm having a stroke again. What are? (laughs) Jesus Christ. Am I going to edit this out? I don't think I will. I'm going to let this fly. In your experience, what are some best practices when preparing to return gear to a manufacturer for warranty? In essence, what do you keep around so you so you are able to return gear without hassles? Boxes, documentation, stickers. Thanks for the podcast. I've used your reviews for making my Amazon wish list, from which I've received so much gear since that time. I have become a regular listener to the Bander Says podcast. Good stuff, sir. Thanks again, Clay. Clay, thank you very much. If anybody remembers, Clay is the host of the Working Cows podcast, WorkingCows.net. Super amazing audience. So cool to see. Now, as far as I should say, great question. Sorry, I had a stroke in the middle of reading your email, but I made it through it. I am still alive. I am still alive. That's all I can say. (laughs) To be honest, if you're not a stupid idiot like me and you don't buy hundreds of microphones where the boxes become a significant space problem, a space concern, then keep everything keep everything. I don't see any reason why you would, if you have two microphones and an audio interface, I see no reason to not keep the boxes for those because the boxes are relatively small. You can throw them under a bed. You can throw them in your closet on the top shelf. You don't have to look at them. Just keep them. It will make it shipping a lot easier, but also it will maintain a little bit of resellability. What I mean by that is I would personally be much more likely to buy a used product if they still had the box, the documentation, the stickers, everything that came with it. Seems like, okay, this person may take better care of their gear. Probably not true in some cases, but it makes it, it gives off that vibe. Now I'll share a couple of warranty experiences, warranty experiences. (laughs) I can't even say warranty, warranty, warranty experiences that I have had. 
with blue. When I had to send a microphone back for repair, I just sent it in the little wooden box that it comes in. I didn't have their original packaging or anything, and they didn't require anything else because they were just repairing it. I sent him back in the wooden box. Then three and a half months later, I got the microphone back. I still need to make a video on that. With Electro Voice, I had to keep everything, and I am glad that I did. I sent them back the RE27ND and the original hard shell carrying case with the documentation and the accessories. And the reason I sent all of that back, they just shipped me a brand new one. That easy. So I did need to have everything. I didn't have the original box, I don't think. Although the original box, sorry about that, I just rubbed the microphone. The original box wasn't all fancy. That's with Electro Voice and with Sennheiser. Same thing as Blue, I just shipped the microphone back in the original packaging because I still had it and shipped it back once they repaired it. So to summarize, the reason I suggest keeping the original packaging is because if they pack it well enough to ship to you without breaking, chances are if you ship it in that original packaging, it won't break because they know how to package stuff well enough to not break one way. Why would it break on the other way? Just a little bit of thought there. <laughs> and also... I'm sorry, I'm coughing up a storm. And also, it does give you some extra resellability. So hopefully that helps. I know I am all over the place, but there you have it. Next comment or next email comes from Scipio Bookings. Hello, I appreciate your videos. I have a question. I have a clone tube mic and a Blue Spark SL. I want a Sony C800G. I am a pop singer, R&B, rock trendy, alternative rap singer, rapper. I want a deep low ed bass mic for $300 max price. Please help me. Thank you. Three top choices. I don't know what you mean by deep low ed bass mic. I don't know what that means. I, I don't know what that means. And secondly, I doubt you'll even hear this because you sent this to my business email. So chances are you're not going to see this or hear this. And to answer your subject, your subject line says serious mic question. This is not a serious mic question. This is you just saying, I don't want to do the research. Tell me what to buy. And then if I'm unhappy with it, I can blame you. <laughs> That's how I'm reading this email. So he goes on. No, I already read his email. Here are some responses to your serious microphone question. The Bayer Dynamic M201TG has a huge amount of proximity effect and has a good clarity on the top. A very good microphone. I like how it sounds. Maybe out of your budget, but if it's a serious microphone question, there's a serious answer. The Sennheiser MK4 also has a good amount of proximity effect, and it's rather smooth, and I think that's about $300. Serious answer for a serious microphone question. And last answer for your microphone question, if you want a lot of bass, look into some ribbon microphones. There are some MXL ribbon microphones that are $100. They have a lot of proximity effect. And if you're looking for low-ed bass, low-ed bass mic, deep low-ed bass mic, ribbon microphones, look into them. Cheap, serious question for a serious answer. That's not right, but we're going with it. <laughs> and the last email comes from Alex. Sorry about that. I went off on that guy. I shouldn't. I don't understand people thinking. It says... Business inquiries only and thinking that asking for advice is a business inquiry. It's not a business inquiry. Just so you know. Last email. I'm sorry. Last email comes from Alex. He says, hello, Mr. Bandrew. What are you going to do if EU Article 13 is passed? What thing are you waiting for in 2019? Will you do any new projects or the more creator case study in 2019? How was your day and how do you feel about episode 150? What podcast do you recommend for engineer or designer? Happy New Year podcastage and BSP, have a good year. Alex, thank you very much for the email. Sorry it took me so long to get to it. I am just, my nose is running. I have allergies, I guess. It is, I am just getting to the end of December emails. So what will I do if article 13 is passed? It honestly depends on how it affects YouTube's processes. What I mean is if Article 13 being passed leads to YouTube saying, OK, we will no longer accept user generated content because we have no way to properly screen that to ensure 
There is no copyright in material. We have no way to ensure that we will not be sued for copyright infringement. If YouTube does that, then I will have to go ahead and start uploading files to my own website. I will have to get a website and start hosting my own videos. If that's not the case, then I'll just continue to upload to YouTube because I don't include any copyrighted material in my reviews or my podcast. So I should be fine there. But if they just say, we're not going to even deal with this problem, we're just going to stop allowing user uploaded content, which I highly doubt would ever happen, then I would upload to my own website. What I what am I excited for in 2019? All the new gear coming out, like the Rode Pod mic. I can't wait to test that one out because I am I'm somewhat skeptical of it based on their video where they were talking into it. It sounds very bright, but I think they were probably using the Oral Exciter, which I hated. I hated the Oral Exciter, but I am very excited to see what that one sounds like. Then the one I am most excited for, the Aston Stealth. The other Aston microphones, like I said about the pod mic, very bright. Not too fond of the audio that I've heard from them, but the stealth. I'm a fan of dynamics. I make no secrets of that. And that one looks good. And then the audience Sono, that's an awesome looking interface. I want to try that one out. And I said it was $600 before. That was the MSRP. I think it's only $450. So a little bit cheaper. All of it seems cool and fun, and I want to play with it. New projects or more creator case study? I still do want to do this, but currently, as I just posted, I am exhausted, and I am trying to focus on a better work-life balance and maintaining the last bit of sanity that I have left and not overexerting myself. So I am not 100% sure when or how I will do these, but I will eventually do them. And I will eventually get back to releasing two videos per week or three videos per week. How is your day going? It's going well. Thank you very much. Episode 150, it was all right. I know you were asking, what am I thinking about doing in 150? <laughs> I'm reading this a month late, month and a half late. Uh, podcast recommendations for engineer or designer. I am not familiar with many engineering or design shows. There are a few that I would recommend. 99% Invisible, which is a discussion of all sorts of different design and different mediums, whether it be architecture, whether it be app design, UX, anything. I, I haven't listened in years, but I think that's what they do. And then 20,000 Hertz, 20 kilohertz. It's a show about sound design. I don't know what kind of design you're talking about, but if you're interested in sound design, really, really cool show there. Thank you very much for the email, Alex. Appreciate you. Last email comes from the eldest bro. Hey, Bandrew, got a question for you. What is a good way to stop a fan from angering my noise gate without using a high pass filter? My mic is kind of far away from my mouth, so using the built in high pass, I lose some of that lovely low end and would like to have that back. Hope you have a good one. Eldest bro, currently one cold eldest boy on Discord. I don't know if he's still one cold eldest boy. Like I said, a month and a half later. I think there are a few solutions for you. Eldest, by the way, thank you for the email. Appreciate you. First solution, the easiest solution, turn off the fan. Turn off the fan. Eldest, turn it off. <laughs> That'll solve your problem real quick. How do I stop the fan from screwing with my gate? Turn off the fan. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easiest solution. The second one, get the microphone closer to your mouth, decrease that signal to noise ratio, the signal being your voice, the noise being the fan, everything else around you. Third, this may be unintuitive and it may not be the solution you're looking for, but if your gate has the ability to adjust how much it is gating, what I mean by when the gate enables, how much is it cutting off or how much it is, is it decreasing the signal? It could decrease at negative infinity and just mute the signal. Or you could have the option to maybe just do negative 10, negative 12, negative 14 decibels. And that will make it a lot less jarring when the gate enables and de dis disables, disables and enables. Disables and enables. So I think that would be a good solution as well. It will just make it 
less jarring. You will still hear some of the fan in the background because it's it's only attenuating the signal by 12 decibels or 13 decibels or 8 decibels, whatever you choose. But it won't be as jarring. And in my opinion, that is better than just hearing this constant on and off with the gate, which is just abysmal to listen to. I absolutely hate it. But the best solution for you, turn off the fan. Eldest, turn off the fan. Okay, that is it for emails and everything. Now, the personal stuff. I changed the release schedule for podcastage. I I know I sound like a broken record. I posted about it on the social tab of podcastage. I posted in the Discord server. But for anybody who does not frequent those places, I wanted to talk about it here. And I wanted to explain (coughs) my decision to do so a little bit more. I want to start by saying, first off, it's not forever. I am, I guess I should tell you what I'm doing first. I have decreased the amount of videos that I am releasing every single week from two videos per week to one video. So I am only going to be releasing videos on Tuesdays instead of Tuesdays and Fridays. And this is not going to be forever. It is just for the time being. And the reason is my day job has just been getting increasingly more stressful and I have been working longer and longer hours. And that means that when I get home, I am just mentally drained. My mind doesn't want to function. I don't want to do anything. I am typically not in the most pleasant of moods. (laughs) And it, it becomes kind of apparent in the videos. And I think the straw that just broke the camel's back was Cheryl complaining. And it's like, well, I can't even do this. I can't even do this. The one thing that gives me any kind of joy. I can't even do that without somebody complaining and being a little baby about it. F you, Cheryl. F you, right in your stupid mouth. So that's the thing. And I guess, you know what? F*** it. I'll just, I'll, I'll share it all right here. I'm currently at a junction in the whole YouTube thing. So the reason that I am saying that is I have been busting my ass on podcastage for four years or almost four years now with the expectation that I would eventually transition from doing it part time to doing it full time. Theoretically, I could go full time right now, but I would be sacrificing a lot and I would be risking a lot. The reason I say that I am risk averse and I like having health insurance. Health insurance is rather expensive if you don't get health insurance through a company. If you buy it by yourself, you don't have that bargaining power. So you pay a much higher premium and it gets pricey. So that would eat into a lot of my income, but also. If you rely on AdSense, affiliate marketing, stuff like that, your income fluctuates month to month. So for four years, I have been thinking I am eventually going to be able to do this full time and just quit my day job and be a YouTube content creator. Now, after four years, I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe I won't be able to do that. Maybe that's not the case. And if that's not the case, why am I continuously putting myself or wearing myself thin, where I am just burned out and stressed all the time, and I don't know who I am outside of making YouTube videos. When somebody asks, oh, what'd you do this weekend? I looked at microphones. That's not an exciting life to live. So that's the junction that I'm at. Do I want to continue to stress myself and push myself so hard knowing that I may never go full time as a YouTuber? Or do I want to focus more on a work life balance? Or do I just want to slow down for now and regain that sanity that I've lost over pushing myself for the last four years? So the decision that I have to make is do I want to continue to make two to three videos per week? between podcasters and the BSP with the expectation that eventually I could go full-time, but that's not guaranteed, or change my release schedule and allow more time for myself and my day-to-day life and maintain some sanity. All I can say is I know that 100%, I will continue to make videos on both channels because I do love making both of them. And like I said, I think the complaints of Cheryl were just the 
the straw it was the straw that broke the camel's back it was this little voice in the back of my head saying oh you can't even do this without getting complaints <laughs> making the youtube videos was the one place where i didn't get in trouble it was the one place where i didn't get in trouble i didn't get yelled at now now youtube <laughs> getting yelled at this is stupid so that's that's me sharing too much. I know I'm going to keep making videos. I'm going to do what's best for me, but I wanted to be honest. I wanted to vent. I wanted to share with all of you because you guys are awesome and you you listen to me lose my mind on this show. So, I wanted to share that with you. D don't worry, I'm fine. I am not depressed. I am not miserable. I am just burned out. I am exhausted and I am going to take some time for myself to watch some horror films, get disgusted, listen to some music and burn some My Chemical Romance CDs. That's, <laughs> that's a voice chat, 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 chat joke. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to you all next week. If you do want other shows, I just changed up the site over at geeksrising.com. We brought on sunshine and power cuts to the Geeks Rising Podcast Network. First show outside of myself and Logan's to be on it. And I could not be happier to have Heather on board. And she is getting ready to lead up to the Sunshine Summit 2018, which is in March. Go to geeksrising.com. There's a banner there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. I'll see you next week. It feels great to be back. This was a long ass episode. Bye. See ya. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Vandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.